Okay, so it looks like we're live. Um, welcome to Book Sandwiched In. I'm Rory Martirana. I am an adult services librarian here at the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, joined today by John Cullen, my colleague, who works in our tech services department, um, doing some cataloging, and Kate Washington, who is the author of Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in America. And she's here to talk about her book today and her experience caregiving for her husband. Um, so without further ado, Kate, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Rory. Um, as she said, I'm Kate Washington. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my book, Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in America is a memoir of my experience caring for my husband through two different kinds of cancer and a stem cell transplant as well as a look at the broader landscape of caregiving in America today. Um, and when I talk about caregiving, I'm really referring to unpaid family caregiving for an ill or a dependent family member. Um, the AARP has done a lot of research around this topic that shows that there are 53 million caregivers in America now, um, which is an enormous staggering number. And that doesn't count the people who are caring for sick kids. Um, it doesn't count parents. It doesn't count other kinds of caring work. So it's a really enormous and I think under-recognized um, phenomenon um, that people are doing enormous amounts of labor and caregiving for their loved ones. Without compensation, it has enormous economic effects. People have to step out of jobs, step out of work, um, lose money over the course of a lifetime. The ARP has also figured the value of unpaid caregiving work at $470 billion a year, which if you think about, you know, what an enormous segment that is of our economy is really kind of staggering to think about. I came to the idea of writing a book about caregiving work, um, not because I was pre previously a caregiving advocate, I was previously a writer and I became pulled into caregiving because of my husband's needs. He became ill with cancer, um, a form of lymphoma at the age of 44, I was 42. He, um, came to me actually on the day our younger daughter started kindergarten. She's now 11, but at the time she was, uh, she was starting kindergarten and I was in that sort of mode of like, okay, like it's time for me. The kids are going back to school. I'm going to have more time and space to focus on my writing. And that morning I was kind of making plans and thinking about what to do next and enjoying the quiet of having kids at school. And, um, he came and he's always worn a beard and he said, you know, I have these funny lumps along my jaw. Do you think I should go see the doctor? And I was like, mm, that's weird. He's like, well, maybe he used to play hockey. So he was like, maybe I took a hockey puck at some point and it's like old bruises or something. But I was like, yeah, I think you should probably go see the doctor. Well, it took several months to figure out what was going on. You know, he first went to the doctor and he's like, young-ish, healthy seeming guy. He'd actually lost a lot of weight over the preceding several months, which was nagging at the back of my mind as he asked me about this as well. Um, we'd been at a wedding at one point and a friend had been like, Brad is so skinny, does, does he have cancer? And I was like, no, of course he doesn't have cancer. Well, it turned out after a lot of diagnostic um, workups and a lot of doctors saying like, oh, you probably don't need to be looked at probably nothing, but if you really want, we'll biopsy it. Well, we always said, yes, we really want that and push for it. And, but it took a few inconclusive biopsies and figuring out what was going on for him to get diagnosed with uh, this form of lymphoma that turned really aggressive. And along the way, I really, over that period of diagnosis, I really wasn't thinking of myself as his caregiver. You know, he was, he was perfectly independent. He was going to the doctor. I was going with him. I was taking notes. I was making calls, you know, to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society once we kind of had a preliminary diagnosis to find out what his treatment plan might look like. So I was doing all of those things of easing into caring for him without even really realizing it. And I think a lot of people go into caregiving almost unawares. You know, you start going to those doctor's appointments, you're, you're with your loved one. And of course you want people to you want to be taking care of the people you love. That's an important thing for all of us. 
Um, but it can really quickly become overwhelming. And I found that out when Brad's cancer turned really aggressive. He suddenly started coughing up blood one night before we were sitting down to dinner. And it turned out he had a lung tumor that had ruptured. It had been growing really quickly without anybody realizing it. And he needed chemo urgently. I drove him to the um, I drove him to the medical center, which is near our house. And there was a, another kind of diagnostic uncertainty, but that was kind of the crisis moment where I was all of a sudden like, now I'm the advocate. I am in the emergency room. I am in the hospital room. Once he got admitted, I'm pushing for them to look more closely, figure out what's happening, getting really involved in his treatment plan, talking to a lot of doctors. He, he's unfortunately very squeamish. Um, so I remember sitting and reading to him while they were inserting a pick line so that he could get chemo because he couldn't stand the thought of the needle going in, but he uh, urgently needed it and couldn't have chemo without it. So I remember reading aloud to him bedside while that was happening, um, doing all kinds of, you know, pretty intense forms of care. And that was the start of a long journey for him with chemo where he was hospitalized. So then I was home with the kids while he was hospitalized with chemo. I was taking care of everything in the home front while he was recovering. And the role of caring for him expanded pretty quickly to fill quite a lot of my time. You know, he came home from the hospital um, on oxygen and needing IV antibiotics, which I was very surprised to learn that the person who gives the IV antibiotics is the home family caregiver, i.e. me, who had absolutely zero medical training. And they sent a nurse and she had about half an hour to show me how to do that. And I was like, are you kidding me? You want me to actually do like work with his line? I could introduce an infection. I could introduce an air bubble. What am I supposed to do? Um, but I later learned in researching my book that this is something that millions of families face across America every day, that the medical system really relies on families to provide a pretty high level of unpaid care with, with pretty minimal support and training. You know, I got all of the equipment delivered in giant boxes full of ice packs that I would unpack and then try to figure, not feel too bad about, you know, throwing all the plastic waste from everything in the garbage. Um, they were all delivered to the house and I gave him his antibiotics and, you know, three times a day at eight hour intervals and it all went okay. But the toll on me and my concerns about, you know, whether he was really getting the best care were really high through all of that. Um, over the course of his illness, you know, he actually relapsed after his chemo very quickly. And I this is a story I tell, of course, in much more detail in my book, but he needed a stem cell transplant, which is also known as a bone marrow transplant, essentially a new immune system to fight the cancer. And this is, I think of this often as like a scorched earth kind of treatment. You know, they give him or any patient who needs a stem cell transplant a great deal of chemotherapy and radiation. There are different protocols, but in his case, really high levels to take his immune system down to absolute zero. And then he was very fortunate to be a match with his brother um, who could donate stem cells, uh, which is a non-invasive procedure for the donor. And then they give him the stem cells and there's a long period in the hospital of waiting for what's called engraftment where the new stem cells make their way into his, my husband's bone marrow and start to grow a new immune system. And the dangers of this are that the new immune system can really, um, even, even in a perfect match, the new immune system can reject the host, the, the, per, the patient. And that's what happened in, in Brad's case. It's similar to a solid organ transplant if you've ever heard of them giving um, immune suppressant drugs to prevent rejection. This is kind of the inverse. The, um, the new immune system is in the host and um, looks around and is like, this is unfamiliar territory, we're gonna attack. So inflammation can happen all over. Brad became very ill with what's called graft versus host disease. And he spent four and a half months in the hospital. He lost his vision. He became unable to walk. Um, he had incredibly traumatic and difficult gut and um, intestinal symptoms and was unable to eat for, for several months as well. So when he came home from that hospitalization, 
he was on um, he was on uh, intravenous nutrition, and the care needs after the months in the hospital, as anybody who has ever had a family member in the hospital, I'm sure can attest, it's really stressful to be supporting somebody you love in the hospital. You know, you go there, you're waiting for the doctors. They they invariably come at the exact moment you've decided that you cannot live another second without coffee and you've gone to the coffee kiosk. That's when rounds happen or the moment when you had to go out to pick up somebody from school or whatever it may be. The, the, the logic of the hospital waits for no caregiver um, typically. Um, and so I already felt really drained and um, exhausted by all that hospitalization time. And at the same time, I was writing some bedside um, in the hospital. I was often like scribbling down things, making notes, trying to um, keep up with uh, journal entries and things like that. And those writings ended up being kind of the genesis of this book. But when Brad came home, and this was in 2016, when he came home from the hospital from his stem cell transplant, I realized, oh, the hospital was not the most stressful part. Home is going to be the most stressful part when he came home again. And I thought I would just read a brief section from the book about his hospital discharge from that period. And um, then after I do that, I will open it up to questions. Um, I'd love to talk more about kind of some of the systemic aspects of caregiving, all of the you know, changes that we could be making to become a more caregiving uh, friendly society that supports people in need and their caregivers. Um, but I'll just, uh, I'll just read this short section called Discharge from the middle of my book. And I'm gonna put on my glasses and sometimes they interact poorly with Zoom and glare. So forgive me, but I'll take them off again after, I have, after I've read this section. So. The possibility of Brad coming home became ever more real as April turned to May. As tired as we all were of the hospital, his care needs were overwhelming. He was still visually impaired and his tarsorophy, which required a good two hours of hands-on care per day, was still in place. The tarsorophy, I should say, is they, they had had to sew his eyelids shut to try to promote healing in his eyes. That was a whole thing. Um, in the end, it was taken out before he was discharged, but he was still functionally sightless. He was on intravenous nutrition for 10 hours a day. He couldn't walk, shower, use the toilet, or dress independently, much less prepare food for himself. His hands shook with tremors from neuropathy. I was shocked to learn what kinds of care I was expected to administer, just as I had been the year before when Brad went home on IV antibiotics. Because Brad's needs at home would be so complicated, I asked to meet with his entire care team in what was called a discharge conference. The idea was to discuss in detail his needs and how to manage them. I came with an extra advocate, a friend who was launching a business as a care coordinator. We were her guinea pig clients and she was invaluable during the discharge process, especially in advising what I should be asking for. But asking the right questions didn't always help. At one point in the conference, a particularly callous senior physician waved aside my concerns about administering intravenous nutrition, saying that patients could just plug it in. She seemed to mean that a patient could self-administer the nutrition even without a caregiver's assistance, which might be possible in some cases, but certainly not in Brad's. The process, far from an easy plug-in, was a complex multi-step procedure involving delicate operations, such as using a syringe to inject a vitamin pack into the bag of TPN, and slowly priming the pump before attaching it to an external catheter. Just setting it up took a minimum of 20 minutes and that was after I got good at it. We had a dedicated caseworker at Brad's health insurance company who called me to say she, fe she felt he still had too many complications and would be safer for now in the hospital. It struck me as telling that even the insurance company would rather pay for him to stay in the hospital than send him home. But the hospital insisted I've once long suspected, though I can't be sure, that Brad was discharged when he was, partly because he was nearing the end of the contracted length of stay negotiated for stem cell transplants. By discharging him over my protests, the medical group transferred the responsibility for excess costs, including the hidden opportunity costs associated with the time it took me to coordinate care, negotiate with insurance, and care for Brad myself, directly to us. At first I asked whether it might not be better to send him to a skilled nursing facility for more rehab, but that insurance caseworker went to bat for us to get comprehensive in-home rehab services covered, a rarity 
Even she, however, couldn't get coverage for home care workers who are never covered by insurance. The hospital discharge coordinators were practically throwing equipment at us too. A wheelchair, a bigger pill organizer, a commode, a shower chair. Did he need a walker? I had no idea, but he declined. He did accept a cane and he already had a white cane to use for his visual impairment. Did he need grab bars in the shower and by the toilet? Yes, the discharge department re referred me to an installer. Meanwhile, I was deep cleaning the house, getting the exterior washed, having the car detailed. Everything had to be as sanitary as possible. It's because he was severely immune suppressed, which has continued throughout his uh, time after treatment. In the lead up to discharge, Dr. T, his primary physician, told me that after Brad came home, he would need attendance 24 hours a day and could not be left alone even for a moment. When I pointed out that I had two children and they needed to be taken places such as school, he replied, well, usually family steps in and it works out fine. I wanted to ask the doctor whether his family was available because mine certainly wasn't. My father and brother lived 90, mother, 90 minutes away. By the time of Brad's discharge, my in-laws had already been in California to help for more than four months. The assumption that all patients have care help standing by is common as memoirist Ann Boyer, who was discharged over her own protest the same day she had a double mastectomy, notes, quote, you are not supposed to be alone when you get home, but no one really asks how you manage it once you're forced out of the surgical center, who, if anyone, you have to care for you, what sacrifices these caregivers might have to make or the support they require. I got the distinct feeling that speaking up about the hardship of providing 24-hour care was considered in poor taste, a caregiving faux pas, a sign I was insufficiently committed to my husband's recovery. Everyone involved with his discharge clearly preferred not to know how we would manage. It was as if I had been rendered invisible by the someone else's problem field in Douglas Adams's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I was not a person to them. I was an element of their patient's treatment. So that's just a moment in time from my caregiving time. And I, I'll also add, that that reference at the end um, to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one, you know, small small reference to literature, but another element of my book that I wove in throughout is a look at caregivers in literature. Um, in other places in the book, I discuss Jane Eyre, I discuss Middlemarch, I discuss The Color Purple, the recent novel by Rebecca Mackay, The Great Believers, um, which deals very movingly with AIDS caregiving in the 80s. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was an awareness that my story, my specific story with all those details that I just went through and read is just one of millions of caregiving stories. And that there are also thousands upon thousands of representations of caregiving in our culture. Um, many of which, and I have a background in studying literature from my days in academia, I'd read all these classic novels that were full of caregivers. And honestly, I'd never really noticed them. They weren't part of my field of vision. They weren't part of the thing that was really I was really thinking about when I was young and studying literature. And during my time as a caregiver, when I went back to those novels, I started seeing really clearly, like, these are stories of care. I can identify with this. Sometimes I can identify deeply. Sometimes I feel, you know, very differently from the caregivers who are being represented. But it really struck me that there were a lot of untold stories out there and overlooked stories of the kinds of care that we provide to other people. And that the care we provide to other people and those ties are really a deeply, deeply important part of what makes us human and what ties us all together as a society. And we're really not supporting it. We're leaving people to flail kind of in individual families, to lose money, to lose time, to lose sleep, to become stressed and burned out. And that was really the story that I was trying to tell and push back against in my book. And that's um, kind of what brings me here today. So with that, I would love to you know open it up to more conversation to questions and uh, see a little a brief note in the chat but uh, we can questions and comments I really appreciated the literary illusions Kate I, I was an English major as an undergrad and then I was an English teacher before I was a librarian so I 
that made it more rich and, and easier to um, relate to since I don't have much experience on my own as a caregiver. So I thought that was a good addition. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. You even referenced Miss Clavel and Madeline. Uh, I <laughs> thought that was something I could definitely relate to uh, when Madeline gets appendicitis <laughs> and Miss <laughs> Clavel is running around like crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked about Miss um, Clavel, who you know had been on my mind because when my husband got sick, my younger daughter was five and then six, and so I, you know we were still in the reading Madeline years, reading Madeline aloud for sure. And um, I really noticed her in the time after my husband's like most acute illness. You know, there's that moment when she, at the end of the book, after Madeline has been ill and recovered, anytime Miss Clavel he hears a noise, she sits up in bed, she's really alarmed and, you know, and afraid of a disaster, Miss Clavel ran fast and faster to see to the girls who are in her care to see if anybody else is sick or there's any other emergency. And it really struck me that I think, you know, caregivers in the post caregiving phase really often go on high alert. Um, there's a lot of post trauma kind of stress that that remains afterwards. So for me, Miss Clavel was kind of a symbol of that, of, you know, hypervigilance after the fact, you know, that you, you become kind of marked by caring for somebody by going through these emergencies. And that's part of the stress and the, the challenge of, of caring for somebody. I was excited. Susan Sontag was in there too. For <laughs> yes. Qu quickly, but you kept coming back quickly. to Jane Eyre, which is like one of my favorite books of all time. So that was great. One of mine too. Yeah. Um, trying. I I was wondering about you were talking about sort of the stages of grief as it relates to caregiving. Like, um, Brad, as you mentioned when we started, like he's still alive today, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, but you were sort of grieving losing the Brad that you knew before he had gotten sick. Um, and as you're describing your feelings, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of um, uh, different stages of grief, like bargaining and such. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Also, um, there was a lot of you kept returning to anger um, and how anger, you had a lot of anger and there wasn't really an outlet for the anger, but also it fueled you to keep going. Um, I'm mm -hmm. hoping you've kind of worked out a little bit of that <laughs> yes. now since he's doing a little better, but um, yeah. can you talk about that a bit without giving away everything you wrote in the book? <laughs> you know, it's certainly, certainly. Yeah, I should say, um, as, as you said, Brad is doing quite a bit better today. Um, he is chronically ill, um, so he kind of suffers with disability and is still in treatment, but he recovered his vision, is much more able to manage his own care. But yeah, I think that anger and other negative emotions, like people often feel resentment. I certainly sometimes did at the high level of, you know, demands that were placed on me, mostly by circumstance. You know, I think illness and major shifts in life can provoke this huge range of emotions. And, you know, when somebody gets cancer, it's not like I could be really angry at him, he didn't mean to get the cancer. There was no proper kind of channel for that frustration and sometimes that rage. And then sometimes there were conflicts between us about you know parts of his treatment or what he would do next um, that that did you know kind of bring up those angry feelings because I felt like I was kind of often once again being you know, put to the back of the line. Like there was a, there was one period that I'm thinking of when Brad was hoping to go back to work as a college professor um, while he was still severely visually impaired and had really, really limited energy. And um, I was really frustrated that he kind of couldn't see how much of that, uh, how much of his time and all of his energy would be taken by that. 
at the expense of our family and of my, you know, my ability to do really anything else besides support the family and support him in that role. And so that, that, you know, prompted quite a lot of conflict. You know, I, um, you know, I really had to reckon with a lot of choices that I'd made over the course of my life. I became a freelance writer and went more to part-time work, which was my own choice, but conditioned by a lot of other things. And so it, it prompted me to kind of revisit a lot of things and grieve and feel frustrated at, um, you know, many kind of life circumstances, which, you know, I, as I say in the book at one point, I kind of joked to my friends that it was my very inconvenient midlife crisis because it was very ill-timed and I was in my mid forties, which is a time that a lot of people have a reckoning about like, what have I chosen? Where am I? Why, why are things like this? Um, and where, you know, anger often comes up. And I think it's been interesting. There's a real spate. Um, there's been a, a large number of books and kind of cultural conversation around anger over the past few years, particularly women's anger. The Me Too movement is obviously not directly related to caregiving, but has brought up a, you know, a lot of, you know, more honest discussion of what women in particular have put up with and swallowed and tamped down and not been forthright about over the years. And so one of my goals in the book was to be honest about some of those more unpalatable emotions, because I also think that for caregivers, there's a real pressure to be the saintly, self-sacrificing caregiver. That's kind of the cultural um, framing of the role in a lot of ways. And it can provoke a lot of shame and discomfort and guilt in caregivers who are feeling the negative emotions that come with, you know, giving up your own life and interests with the hard work of caregiving, with being stressed and tired and potentially burned out. And I'm also really conscious that my own caregiving time, the really intense period of it was a few years, but there are people who say are caring for folks with degenerative disease or long-term things who can be caregivers for 20 years and more and for whom that journey really ends in really profound in in grief and in permanent loss so i'm very fortunate that you know brad survived and that he's doing better today you know we do have changes in our lives and what we had expected them to be and we do mourn that but um it's a very different journey than what a lot of people have but i i, I hoped to give voice to some of those emotions and, and, you know, help people feel a little more seen and a little more validated in the, the complex um, stew of emotions that, that caregiving and those relationships can bring. I had one question, Kate. Yeah. Um, like when you're describing uh, caring for him without losing myself, that was the phrase you used. And I guess because you're in your 40s, you were a wife, you were a mom, you were a writer, you had a column in a newspaper, you were a friend, and all of that, all of that seemed to be put on hold, and you became the caregiver, almost like kind of objectified. And how how did you cope with that? Did did writing the book help you with that, help you along with that? Yeah, I would say it really did. And one of the ways that I did cope with that was, I, I think I mentioned as I was talking earlier, you know, that I was doing some writing even in the hospital. I stayed in a writing workshop that I've been in on and off for years. That's an online one. And so in that workshop, we typically post pages once a month. And usually I would try to do something more considered or more fully developed. But I think during the time when Brad was the most ill, I was just posting whatever, you know, thing I'd managed to scratch out that was often kind of a rant, you know, but that even that just kept me in touch with my identity as a writer. Um, one of the things that I did as a, as a parent, you know, because my, our daughters were in the elementary school years, so 10 and five when Brad was diagnosed and on through through elementary school, you know, I was also really conscious that 
this was their one childhood and my one chance to be their mom at those ages, which are like really fun ages. So often, um, you know, like during the summer when Brad was going through chemo and he would be in the hospital for four or five days at a time, every time he was going through chemo, um, I tended to prioritize doing something fun with the girls during those times. Like that was during the summer, we would go out of town. Like we, we went, I think we went camping one time, a couple of times I, I would take them on little trips and try to do something that wasn't strictly caregiving focused and that could, you know, keep their childhood and my sense of doing something outside of that, um, outside of that role alive for myself. Um, it was definitely a struggle and it was hard to lose the identity of working um, because I wasn't doing very much work for pay and my freelance writing during that period. So coming back to more serious writing and being able to develop and write this book was a pretty critical part of like coming, coming back to my full sense of self. You know, um, I really wanted to tell this story um, as I said before, in a way that, you know, other caregivers could feel a sense of recognition, but also where I could feel a full sense of recognizing who I was. And part of the reason that I included, for instance, the literary references, and I will say that as I was developing this book, I remember one time years ago, uh, a few years ago, I met with an agent who was like, oh, drop the literary stuff. Like nobody will want the literary stuff. But it was it was really important to me because it it reaches back to a period of my life that was, you know, I was in a PhD program through most of my 20s working on Victorian literature. And so engaging with those texts felt like it brought in kind of a critical piece of, of who I was in addition to you know, telling the memoir parts of the story, you know, there, there's a lot in the book that is um, my personal history, not just as a caregiver, but throughout my life. So. Did Brad read the book? He did. He's read what, it a few times. Yeah. What did you think of it? Did it start any fights? Um, you're um, very honest. Not, di not directly. He was actually, he was very, very supportive. Um, he's been really great about, um, you know, kind of acknowledging like it was my turn to focus on this. Um, and he, it helps, I think he is also a writer and a poet and he was really supportive of saying like every writer needs to tell their own story. And if you can't be honest about that, you know, what, there's no point in pursuing it. Um, so he, I'm sure there were a few things here and there that he didn't like, but he didn't censor me or, um, you know, ask me to stand down from things really. So, um, and, you know, he told me he liked the book. He told me he thought it was, you know, a good piece of work and, um, you know, has been, has been a big cheerleader around it. And that too has actually been really healing in a way. Um, it's been, you know, good for our relationship to feel that support and, um, you know, have that, have that element um, back in the relationship. Because one of the things that gets a little bit lost with the caregiving and when he was really ill through no fault of his, you know, he couldn't provide me with, you know, emotional or other or practical kinds of support when he was at his most ill. And so, one of the hard things about going through caregiving for a spouse is that you lose the partnership at the exact time you need it the most. Um, so the relationship had felt really lopsided and this and his support for the book, you know, helps restore some of that balance. Can you talk a little bit about the immunocompromised nature of Brad's illness, uh, especially in terms of COVID? Uh, is it right that vaccination wouldn't provide pr pr uh, protection against COVID? Uh, so that's that's a complicated question, and the research is um, is mixed. I would say on that. However, mm -hmm. um, so in Brad's case he has an immune system provided by the donation from his brother. Um, he takes a, an immune suppressant. There's kind of a complicated balance that needs to happen where his immune system needs to be working enough to prevent a recurrence of the original cancer. 
and to prevent him from getting deathly ill from anything that comes along, of course, but it also needs to be tamped down to keep this inflammation effect the the graft versus host in check and that can flare up at any time that causes skin conditions and digestive conditions and can mess with the liver enzymes and other things so he does get graft versus host flare-ups um and those are treated with uh typically with prednisone and he he goes through this this complicated procedure that treat treats his blood cells with light to keep his immune system, um, his immune function lower. So they're, they're always kind of like playing with that balance in a tricky way. Um, we were very concerned obviously during COVID. So we were pretty, we were locked down pretty tightly. And that, that was an interesting thing because it did take me a little bit back to the caregiving days in the sense that like, I was doing all of the interface with the outside world um, and trying to be very careful. And we had gone through that once before when he came home from transplant and was more severe, severely immune suppressed than he is right now. You know, So we already had hand san sanitizer stationed at every door and we were like big on the hand washing train and when he was in the hospital and sometimes like we had been masking and things like that. So it's kind of a, it felt a little bit like, oh, back to this again. Like the rest of the world has just caught up to where we already were. <laughs> like, welcome everyone <laughs> to, to that. Um, when the vaccine came, um, it was, uh, you know, uncertain whether it would work for him. He has been revaccinated for like childhood diseases and things like that. Um, he is a, he had to wait a significant amount of time after his stem cell transplant to get any kind of vaccine, but he, he does have the most of the vaccinations, um, I think that are typical and he did get the COVID vaccine. And once he was fully vaccinated, he was like, great, like I'm going out, like, I can't wait, like I'm going to go to a restaurant, et cetera. And we actually had a little, um, uh, recurrence, I guess you would say, of some of our disagreements about his care, because I was like, you know, not all bone marrow transplant survivors, like it doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody is building antibodies. Like I, you know, you may want to raise that with your doctor and look into it. And he, I could just see him being like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Like, don't like, don't push me on this. Like I, he wanted to do things out in the world. Um, and so I kind of dropped it. I was like, I didn't want to have a fight about it. Um, and I could tell that he was just like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. I'm so over it. Because it does get, as anyone I think who's been through long illness knows, like sometimes you're just tired of dealing with it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he was tired of dealing with it. So he, we didn't talk about it again. And then um, last week or two weeks ago, he actually told me, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get that antibody test today. So he did talk to his doctor about it and he did schedule the test to see if he had built um, antibodies to COVID for, based on the vaccination. And it turned out that he had. So we feel like he's pretty well protected at this point. Um, I'm also fully vaccinated. We live in California. So there was some question about like, when will he be eligible? How, and then everything opened up much more rapidly than, than people thought. And now we have my daughter who's 15 gets her second dose this weekend and the 11 year old who turns 12 in the summer is like, it's so unfair that everyone else is vaccinated <laughs> in the family, but she, her turn will come, so. Yeah. Hey, I had one question about one of the sure. chapters. The title of the chapter is, there's no reasonable option but to keep going. And mm -hmm. I could just feel your loneliness in that chapter it was like almost like a turning point where you more or less felt all by yourself. And I was wondering if you could, could expand on that a little bit uh, because it, it was interesting how you proceeded from then to the end of the book. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that phrase really struck me. It came actually from talking to a friend who um, went through a really difficult caregiving journey of her own that happened around the time of their family having a newborn and she was the caregiver and the spouse was very, very ill in the same hospital where 
the newborn was born. And I remember saying to my friend, you know, what, how did you get through it? And she's like, well, there just that there was no other option. There was a, a lack of any other reasonable options. You just have to keep going because what are you going to do? Run away from home, leave your children. You can't. And, um, you know, I, that chapter is largely about the phenomenon of sandwich caregiving and of multiple and conflicting responsibilities. And, you know, I was caring for our kids and for Brad and, you know, it's interesting, you know, that you, you zeroed in on the loneliness and the sense of isolation because I, I was very lonely, but I was also always surrounded by people. You know, I was back and forth to the hospital, um, we had family members, Brad's, Brad's family, his, his parents in particular were, were actually an incredible support. And so we had really a lot of help and a lot of people around, but I felt kind of uniquely um, by myself in the sense that like, I knew ultimately the buck would stop with me, right? Like the kids were my job Brad's care was my job. Ultimately, the other people would leave, you know, they had other lives and responsibilities. And this was my life. And this was my responsibility. And I think, you know, despite the community support that rallied around, um, part of what really produced the loneliness was the feeling that I was going through it at a time when other people that I knew and was close to were not going through a similar kind of thing. Um, a lot of caregiving just takes place behind closed doors. We have a very individualistic culture that puts the responsibility for getting through crises onto the individual. And however much, you know, friends step into support or help, we don't have the broad systemic supports or the culture of community care and networks of care that, um, you know, other cultures do, and that can make this the job of family care really lonely and isolating. I think, you know, we've seen really clearly during the pandemic, how much our society has just devalued care of all types and left individual families to kind of like scramble for solutions for themselves. And it's like every single family is scrambling in its own siloed individual place. And they're all scrambling for the same kinds of things. And if we could all kind of pool our resources and do things like provide, you know, paid family leave and, you know, maybe economic supports for caregiving and different kinds of policies that could undergird, um, you know, a more robust caregiving response, we could really alleviate a lot of that sense of isolation and sense of, of doing it all on our own. You know, we have this, this culture of self-reliance, but, um, you know, we all need other people sometimes. So, you know, I would say that that response was both very personal to me and also a very widespread and um, typical phenomenon in our culture. You mentioned a lot in the book about the balance of labor. Um, at one point you had a conversation with Brad and he was grateful for the life you built and he, he kind of hinted towards it being built for him and was a little oblivious to the fact that it was, you were, you were also doing it for you. Um, and I think in chapter six, you, you had, um, a clip there that said men see nothing to gain in, in becoming more like women. Can, can you talk a little bit about the gendered nature of caregiving and how it, it kind of amplifies, especially in your situation, um, traditional feminine gender roles? Yeah, sure. That That's a, um, a big focus of my book. And I, I certainly don't want to devalue the care work that men do, which is, you know, an important facet. And I think, um, men need to be doing more, more care work. Um, the studies show that most, that caregivers are predominantly women. It's, um, the, the numbers kind of vary, but in the like two thirds roughly range. And also interestingly, if you kind of break down some of those studies, it, it also shows that women, 
do more of the more grueling kind of hands-on care, um, spend more hours, tend to lose out much more economically from caregiving responsibilities. Um, so, you know, it's still, despite the large numbers of male caregivers, I think care work is gendered as female in our culture. Like that goes back to Victorian days and before. Um, and I think that that kind of produces a vicious cycle in a way of devaluation, you know, that invisible labor and unpaid labor is also often very much female. You know, it's interesting, like we don't count a lot of those things in our GDP, the invisible labor that's done around the home, childcare, all the things that studies show still are much more taken on by women. Um, and then what that ends up leading to is the expectation that that should be free labor of some kind. And then a corresponding devaluation of those roles as paid labor. That's something I haven't really talked about yet today. But one thing that I do look at in the book, even though the focus is unpaid family caregiving, um, the role of paid care workers who tend to be women of color, often in um, you know very vulnerable working conditions, often very underpaid, sometimes undocumented or immigrant women. Um, those those roles, I think, get more devalued by the association of lower value with with care work. Um, for myself, I'll just say you know. I am Gen X. I was born in 1972. I, you know, at the I grew up in the, you know, in the you can do it all, you can have it all kind of era, and you know, life is actually there's a lot of choices to be made, and there are still a lot of constraints. And you know, I think my generation was told you can have it all, but there was no corresponding like, and we'll help you. <laughs> by having, you know, universal child care or, you know, changes, cultural changes. It was all to go back to what I was saying before, left up to the individual, you know, with this idea of like, well, if you make these choices and you, you know, decide what to do, you can, you can have it all. Um, I think we as a society kind of need to acknowledge we can have many things and we will do better if we work together to try to get them, right? And think about cultural change and how to better value all the forms of labor that women in particular do domestically and um, you know, in the workplace and everywhere. I, I think to me, it, it all ties in, you know, that there's still, you know, massive pay inequities and, um, particularly for women of color, the all the things that women do are just valued less. Um, I, I recently read a great book um, that's a lot of fun called um, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? That's a look at economics and like why it was decided that, you know, cooking dinner and doing things around the house was not considered part of economic labor and, you know, what we count in our GDP in the first place. Um, you know, and the, those blind spots around how we look at things economically. Um, so I, that kind of made me think a lot recently about how that invisible labor is just taken for granted. So if anyone has a question for Kate, please feel free to put it either in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen or in the chat. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and there's sort of two things that they kind of tie in, is the, the history of collective caregiving in marginal communities that you talked mm -hmm. about in the book, especially like uh, LGBTQIA plus and African Americans, which dated back to slavery, but then you kind of mm -hmm. tie, tie it in at some point with the um, global expectations in different cultures of caregiving. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, I, I was really interested in different models. You know, I talked previously about how, you know, in our sort of self-reliant American culture, we're kind of siloed into individual family units um, providing care. And certainly we have, you know, networks, people do meal trains and 
contribute to GoFundMe's, which is its own whole systemic problem that that is a you know common avenue of funding our healthcare these days. Um, but I think that uh, you know I didn't cover in in a huge amount of depth, as you say, but. Um, one of the places, you know, marginal communities or are, are, are marginalized communities are thrown back on their own resources and people for whom nobody is caring must care for each other. I was really struck by this and there's a lot of research on, on it in reading about, um, you know, the AIDS crisis of the 80s, which I mentioned previously, that, um, you know, the, the primary victims of the AIDS crisis were people who were often estranged from their own family of origins, had been, families of origin, had been kicked out and were very much, um, you know, demonized by society. It was a, it was a, you know, horrible time and, you know, amount of bias and bigotry around, you um, you know, gay people in general and AIDS in particular. I was a I was a teenager as the AIDS crisis was taking off, and I remember, you know, the fear and the loathing and the horrible things that people were saying, uh, you know, about AIDS. And um, you know, so that that community formed networks of care. Um, lesbians who were the lesbian community who is not you know as directly affected by AIDS often stepped up to do direct hands-on caregiving at a time when people were not sure what the personal risks would be to them. Um, people formed, you know, really strong chosen family and community networks. And I think it makes for, um, you know, a, a model that all communities can really learn for. You know, people were forced into that to care for each other when, when others would not. But, you know, we could choose that. We could choose those communal approaches to care. Um, I was really inspired, and I mentioned it briefly at the end of the book, by a recent book called How We Show Up by Mia Birdsong that talks about these kinds of um, communal care and building kind of a new kind of community, um, new kinds of ties. Um, so I recommend that book on, on this point. Kate, I have one question. I hope it's a quick <laughs> one anyway. Um, the, um, you talk about post-acute alienation, kind of like a reentry phase where, mm -hmm. all right, the acute phase of your husband's illness was over and things are starting to stabilize. And now you're trying to get to know, get to know your friends again, get to know your mm -hmm. kids again, get to be what you were. <laughs> or what you wanna be actually. And could you describe what worked for you to, to get to that point and, and through that phase? Yeah, yeah. I think um, that's a, a particularly resonant question right now because I think the entire world or at least our entire country is in that, is a little bit in that phase. You know, after 15 months of pandemic strain, everybody's navigating how to re-enter and reconnect. Um, for me, you know, I needed time and patience and to take it kind of slowly, like for jumping right in often provoked, you know, really mixed feelings and, and challenges. And, you know, there were a lot of kind of bumps and I was tired and trying to, you know, rethink and really be attentive to my emotions. I was fortunate to have access to, you know, therapy and counseling to help with some of those challenges. I know that that, um, you know, is certainly not universally accessible and I, I wish it, I very much wish it were. Um, it's interesting, I was talking recently to a clinician who works in psychosocial oncology and her, her focus is on caregiving and caregivers and she does a lot of research in this field and she told me that that's actually the period when the most acute phase of illness is over and people are seeming to be better. That's the period that she find, has found that caregivers are kind of in the most stressed and vulnerable state because they have a moment to take that pause and, and you know, the adrenaline carries, carries you through an acute crisis. Um, and you don't have a moment to take a break and think about the emotions. And then 
things slow down and the emotions all come welling up and you have to deal with them all. And it can be a really, really challenging period. And it certainly, um, you know, I think I'm still kind of looking at the fallout and, and processing a lot of, you know, what happened over those years. So we, we do have a uh, participant question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kate. Wonderful discussion. I'm a caregiver for my 91 year old mother. Are there other countries that have a better model, maybe more socialistic that we could emulate? I'm feeling the burn and hopeful for a socialist revolution and more human society. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yes, you are speaking my language for sure. Yeah, you know, in the last chapter of my book, I do look at some other models. Um, you know, the European social democracies tend not surprisingly to have better safety nets around caregiving. Um, Japan, which is an aging society and, and has aged more quickly than we have, has some really interesting um, innovations as well. I think I've seen a lot of press coverage of Japan has been looking at, you know, caring robots, which I find less kind of enticing than another system that they have, which is um, a caregiver credit system, because I, what I gather is that a lot of people live far apart from their elderly family members, but they've um, introduced a credit exchange where, you know, younger people can care for somebody in the city where they live, and then their elderly relatives back home can kind of cash in those, those credits um, to get caregivers in their own region. So it's like a, a broader network um, of networked care for hands-on care. You know, I think um, there is some hope too on the horizon here for policy change that will push us more toward a social safety net. And when I, I wrote this book, I really wasn't sure whether that would be the case by by this mm. time, you know, whether there would be any possibility of, um, of legislative change. But paid family leave is on the table with a good <clears throat> chance of passing, which I think is a you know, a, a really good support um, possibility. The Biden administration um, in the campaign actually put in a caregiving reform plank to its platform. And they're looking at um, the $400 billion like in the American Jobs Plan, the infrastructure bill really sees care as a form of infrastructure and would provide training and support to paid care workers that would help, you know, get more home and community-based services to people in need. Um, so I think we have some, uh, some hopeful signs on the horizon, but there are definitely countries um, that are doing it much better than we are doing it. And um, I, I talk about those in more depth in the conclusion to the book. Great. Did you have uh, another question for Kate, John? Just no, actually, uh, <laughs> I don't. I, you've answered all my questions either before we started the question <laughs> round or after. But uh, yeah, I, I'm absolutely delighted that you came to this. And I'm sure folks who tuned in are also delighted to have heard from you. And uh, I just like to say that I think this was a very brave book. Thank you. And Thank you so much. I, I think I think that you you really rose to the occasion and, and you documented it so well. Thank you. I really appreciate that. All right. So I'm just gonna close it out quickly. Um, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, today's event was made possible by gifts to the New Haven Free Public Library Foundation. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider making a donation at nhfpl.org backslash donate to help support our collections, programs like these and services of the library throughout the year. Um, we have two more book sandwiched in events coming up next week on uh, Thursday. We will be talking to Richard Moss about his book, Creating the New Right Ethnic in 1970s America. Um, the intersection of anger and nostalgia. And then on Friday, we'll be chatting with actress Melanie Chardoff, who 
recently published her memoir, Odd Woman Out, Exposure in Essays and Stories, which should be an interesting conversation. She's actually someone who started off locally in New Haven. And thank you so much, Kate. This has been such a great talk. I really loved reading your book. Um, and my heart goes out to you. I hope Brad gets even better and, um, and things get brighter for you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming and um, thank you for your great questions and I really um, appreciate uh, you, you featuring me in the book. <laughs>